hi 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 welcome on board our um, life program and our 40-day journey um, this journey is about us developing spiritually um, to create success in our lives that's the whole idea behind us taking on this program and it is a 40-day program but we call it the new life plan so new life plan we're actually reading this book and reviewing this book the purpose driven life um such an amazing spiritual book that i've come across and i chose to take it on and share with you by recording every minute of us reading this book and giving my insights about the things i'm reading so if you're watching us live on Instagram, welcome on board. Now as usual, what we say on Instagram is we can't guarantee how long the battery takes us and how long the phone can handle because this is a, usually a long recording. So anytime it shuts off, don't give up on us. Just go on YouTube. We always uh, video this thing and record it on YouTube. So on YouTube is all the days. Today is day, day 30. Hip hip, I'm excited. The 30 that shows we've really been committed to this. So, on YouTube, you see at least up to day 29. So, day 30 is what we're doing now, which will come up very soon as well. So, take your time, follow them day by day. Now, one of the biggest reasons I did this is because I know my time is so tight that I will not have time to be reading this book again. So recording this is not just for anybody or just for you, but it's also for me. Because this is a book that I love so much. And I would like to keep understanding and looking at it and reading into it. And, you know, not really reading, but listening to it and getting more and more meaning out of it. Because what you tend to find is just like movies. When you watch a movie for the first time, it might not make any sense. You watch again, it starts to make sense. And you watch again and it begins to add more meaning as you most times what causes that is your state of mind so when your state of mind sees things in a particular way it gives you that meaning so that's why i'm doing this so that we can all take our time to listen to this program over and over and over and make sense out of it why to give us a better life anyway let me not go too much into that let's go straight into it because we haven't got much time um for today today's i mean we're actually very very late into our night time here so the sooner we get this out of the way the better because i'll go another day tomorrow again for other things okay so today is day 30 chapter 30 and it says shaped for serving god that's the title of this this chapter we are shaped for serving god and usually he gives us these two verses that he wants us to look at before we even go into the book he said, your hands shaped me and made me. And that's what God said. Um, Job said that. Job chapter 10 verse 8. And the second one, the people I have shaped for myself will broadcast my praises. And that's Isaiah 43 verse 21. So, we were shaped to serve God. That's a big message here. We were shaped to serve God. Um, God formed every creed creature on this planet with a special area of expertise every creature because this is so interesting because i know my children get really wound up sometimes when they see certain things like like um the spider they, my, my my daughter is so scared of this spider. what is the purpose of this spider on this earth it shouldn't have been there or my other daughter she's so scared of moth and so everybody every creature on this earth even the tiniest of ants has a purpose so every one of us has been created with something there's a reason why that thing is here why that spider is here why that ant is there why that moth is there why each and every one of us are here we have been given a particular role to play that's what he's saying there and some animals run some of them hop some swim some burrow and some fly this is how he's beginning to explain how the various things the various animals the various 
creatures on this earth have various unique roles. So we all have some form of expertise. And so each has a particular role to play based on the way they are shaped by God. So each of us have something unique based on the way God created us. The same is true with humans. Each of us was uniquely designed or shaped to do certain things. So we've been created to do certain things. We've been equipped with certain things in us. Before architects design any new building, they first ask, what will be its purpose? So whenever a building is being erected, put up, the first thing the architects will ask you is, what is the purpose of this building? What is it going to be used for? What will its purpose be? How will it be used? The intended function always determines the form of the building. So based on what the owner will say to the architect, that would then guide the architect while designing this building. And I know for sure that I, the same I practice here with my training in hair braiding, and extensions, and weaves, and all of that that comes in this pack. Now, what happens there is when people call us here and say they want to take on training, the first thing we ask them is, why do you want to go into hair? What's your reason for wanting to go into hair? And so naturally, they will start explaining. And why do we ask that? Because it will guide us to see how we can tailor the training to really suit their needs. Because sometimes, for instance, people say, I want to just braid my daughter's hair. And so if I hear I want to braid my daughter's hair, all I'm thinking is, I'm communicating with you using your daughter all the time. So it begins to connect with you. Your daughter's hair is like this, it's like that. What were you thinking when you thought of doing her hair? Would you want to understand how to comb her hair? Do you, you know, so all these kind of questions will start coming out and then I'll be answering them. And then I'll be guiding you. But I want to work with clients. I want people to walk in and get their hair done. Okay, when people walk in, these are the things you expect. These are the questions. So I start guiding you again in that direction. That's exactly what's going on here. Each of us has been uniquely designed for certain things. That function becomes what determines how that building will be put, put together. That's what would determine how I organize your training. So before God created us, he decided what role he wanted us to play on earth. So each of us, Remember there's a passage in the, in the last chapter. It says, before you even go into your mother's womb, I already molded you, I already designed you, I already knew what role you were going to go out there and play for me. So he planned exactly how he wanted us to serve him. And then he shaped us for those tasks. He planned it already. How, what we, how we were going to be here, what we were going to do, what roles we were going to take on, and then he shaped us to suit that. We are the way, the way, we are the way we are because he made us for different specific tasks or specific ministry. Remember your experience determines your ministry. And so you are simply a sum total of your experiences. And so, I can relate to this as, again as well, because sometimes further, and, further down he's going to be explaining this part, but it's like there are things that you just naturally just blend into. There, there's in one of the chapters where I'd explain, I think when we were talking about uh, uni unity, not uniformity, where I was explaining that I generally just love wearing certain types of jewelry. It has to be big, it has to be bold, it has to be loud. And I have an auntie who just wants the tiniest of, you know, a tiny dot of gold on her neck and she's happy. Same thing with my sister. And so, that's me. That's who I am. Now, because of that, look at me, I tend to talk fashion a lot. And I tend to wear colorful things. So. I was already created in that form and that's why I have this natural liking for louder looking jewelry. So for me when I read this part it all made sense to me. It says the Bible says we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good. Our English word poem comes from the Greek word 
translated workmanship. We are God's handcrafted work of art. So we are God's handcrafted. God crafted each of us in the form of art. Uniquely designed, uniquely created. And again, I relate to this because my daughter is into art and I watch her when she takes her time to design each of her drawings. Handmade, specially crafted. So we are not an assembly line product, mass produced without thought. And so when you're buying something, anytime you want to shop for anything, people are very conscious. Is this individually made or this is off the shelf where they've just thrown out same, same design, 20,000 pieces. And so when you are buying something, 20,000 pieces of same design, the, 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 the excitement for it disappears. Especially with my fashion. I get people walking here and there was a lady who said to me, at last I can relate to clothes that are uniquely made. Because every time I walk into the regular mall, you see the same style all the time and you go out there on the street and you see your, the clothes you're wearing, same exact design and color worn by another person. And that just makes you look like everybody else. But when something is being uniquely designed, something's changing colors changing a pattern is changing then people feel individual about it and so we are custom designed one of a kind original masterpieces each of us and he explains what and that you're gonna see how exciting this chapter is again just like the other ones god deliberately shaped and formed us to serve him in a way that makes our individual ministry unique. He carefully makes the DNA cocktail that created us. David praised God for his incredible personal attention to details. Because for us to be who we are, God made this huge effort to put unique attention to who we individually are. You made all the delicate, inner parts of my body and knits me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. Praising God and thanking him for delicately designing him and, and crafting him in such a unique way. As Ethel Waters said, God doesn't make junk. And this lady called Ethel Waters, God does not make junk. So each of us have been so uniquely made. And you can relate to junk because junk is when something is mass produced. And you hear most times they're talking about um, China, made in China, made in China. And so you buy something and two days later, they're just calling out the product, especially for toys, for kids. The amount of toys that comes out, the same thing, and it doesn't last. Two hours later, it's all gone, broken. And that's what they call junk. But this lady is telling us that God does not make junk because we are so uniquely made. Not only did God shape us before our birth, he planned every day of our lives to support his shaping process. And David continues, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. This means that nothing that happens in our life is insignificant. So you see how every detail about your life has been put together by God. And that's why no matter what you're going through, none of it is insignificant to God. He already noted every day in, in his book. God uses all of it to mold us for our ministry to others and shape us for our service to him. So he's molded us so that we can offer this role that he's uniquely placed us here for. To serve others and also to serve him. God never wastes anything. He will not give us abilities, interests, talents, gifts, personalities, and life experiences unless he intended to use them for his glory. So he's not going to, everything he's given us, Think about yourself from this moment going forward. Every unique thing about you has been put together 
deliberately by God to glorify Him. By identifying and understanding these factors, you can discover God's will for your life. Last chapter, I finished the last chapter. Um, one of the comments on YouTube was, thank you so much for letting me begin to appreciate the reason I was created. This is what this is still also, also telling us. And like I say to, you know, even people watching on Instagram, please feel free to make comments. Because as far as I know, this is one of the best personal development books I can think of. I mean, I've read so many and I don't have to um, talk about how many books I have because as far as I'm concerned, this is one of the biggest things we could ever do to ourselves. One of the first things we need to do as humans, which I wish I was told this growing up, is to clear our understanding of who we are, understanding of our mind. Because the way I see it, the mind is like the kitchen of our life. You know when you go into the kitchen, you arrange the plates, you arrange the pots, you put the food together so you can cook it that you can eat. That's the same thing the mind serves in our body. And so any wrong information getting into the mind starts to create a wrong life for you. Perfect information coming into your mind starts to give you a perfect life. So whatever you become on the outside starts from the inside and so the minute your mind is not right everything around you will not be right and this is one of the biggest things that we are losing out as humans we have not understood our mind at all and i'm beginning to gradually get this message from reading this book i'm beginning to take better control of what my thoughts are going on because the minute you can sort out your mind, your life is beginning to make sense. And I just wish people would understand this. You hear mental problems, you hear depression, you hear anxiety, you hear sadness, you hear anger. All of these things are coming from the mind and it leads to how we feel and how we feel then becomes the life that we have. So if we are wanting a great life, how are we possibly going to get that if our mind is not right? And I was going through this. I was experiencing this of late. And that's when in my usual search for understanding and meaning, I came across, I decided, let me take on this book. So that's what I'm wishing for you to, to be able to overcome all the problems that are sitting there in your mind so you can have a clearer sense of life. Anyway, so... Let's carry on. So he says, David, I've read that one. God uses all of it to mold us for our ministry to others and shape us for our service to him. God never wastes anything. He will not give us abilities. He will not give us interests. He will not give us talents. He will not give us gifts, personalities, and life experiences unless he intends to use it for his glory. By identifying and understanding these factors, you can discover God's will for your life. And the Bible says, you are wonderfully complex. You are a combination of different factors. And to help us remember five of these factors, he created a simple, um, this man created a simple acrostic called shape. So he wants us to understand these five factors by creating this thing he called shape and he's going to explain what that means he says how God shapes us for our ministry that's the little title there whenever God gives us an assignment he always equips us with what we need to accomplish it so every time he tells us to do something he's put something in there that will help us achieve that thing the, co the custom combination of our capabilities is called shape. And so he's going to explain what he means by that. S stands for spiritual gifts. And H stands for our heart. And A stands for our abilities. P stands for our personalities. And E stands for our experience. So you see what that he was trying to explain to us? That's what shape means. 
So he says, shape, unwrapping your spiritual gifts. God has given every believer. I remember the word believer, underline that because it's so important. The spiritual gifts to be used in ministry. The last chapter we talked about ministry. Whenever you have any calling at all, anything that excites you, that brings out the best of you, that is your ministry. So, underlining believer means we need to learn to believe first. We need to learn to say, I do understand this. I do take this on. I am ready to accept this. I believe this. I, ha I have a student in training recently and we we're just chatting and she said to me, Joy, do you really believe there are ghosts? And we were having this good chat about it. And she said, no, I don't believe it. No, I don't believe it. I said, that's good. If you don't believe it, then you're never going to experience it. But if you believe there is, and you give room for it, you might experience it. So that's the same thing here. If you believe that God is there for you, this is where we start to talk about faith. If you believe it, and you put all your trust in him and you give it to him and say father i accept take it on please do it i am here for you once you believe god begins to work for you and so god has given every believer the spiritual gift to be used in ministry these are special god empowered abilities for serving him that are given only to believers here we go again, believers. So for as long as you don't believe, which I know there's so many people out there who say, oh, you're just talking nonsense. I don't believe there is a God. Uh, if there was God, where are there problems in this world? And you hear all kinds of things. And then of course, last minute when they find themselves on their deathbed, then they suddenly start wondering, where is God? Please come and help me. We shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't be like Thomas who never believed until Jesus had his hand and said, he has the, 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 that hole where I was pierced on the cross. You should just learn to believe. Because the minute you believe, we believe there's a supernatural power, we believe there's a spiritual us, we believe that there are things outside of our understanding. The minute you start doing that and you hand it over to God, things will have will start to happen spiritual gifts will be you start understanding them and using them the bible says whoever does not have the spirit cannot receive the gifts that come from god's spirit that's simple because if you don't believe then there is nothing you're going to be expecting from god but when you believe he comes to you and he works with you you can't earn your spiritual gift or deserve them. That's why they are called gifts. So if you don't believe, you will not get them. It is a gift. It is not a right, it is a gift. They are an expression of God's grace to you. So is that grace that we are awake every morning, we go to sleep and we wake up and we go to sleep and when the time is done, we're done. It is God's chosen way Christ has generously divided out his gifts to us neither do you get to choose which gifts you like to have God determines that so we cannot wake up and tell God you know what I'd rather have this one Ooh, my apologies I'd rather have this one or that one you just have to have what gives what God gives you. Paul explained, it is the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So again, you can see that I'm really yawning here. Apologies, it's really late here for me. So Paul explained, it is the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes these gifts. He alone decides which gifts each person should have. So it is only the Holy Spirit that can decide what he thinks is best for you to have. Because God loves variety and he wants us to be special. No single one particular gift is given to everyone. 
not everyone has this one particular gift that's what he's explaining to us that God chooses what he gives to each of us but of course there is not everyone on this earth I, I got a bit confused when I was reading this part not everyone on this earth has one gift as in this gift everyone has it so let's let's take an example patience it's not everybody you know that's extremely patient so another one endurance and patience they're similar and then let's move it further away singing not all of us can sing swimming not all of us can swim dancing not all of us can dance running not all of us can run braiding not all of us can braid and that's why you find each of us are great at certain things and some of us are not because that's how God chose it. No one particular gift is given to all of us. That's the message here. It is all varied and this is why we must respect each other's gift. I am saying that. It is only small minded people who disrespect other people's gifts. So because the way God organized it, he doesn't give all of us the one thing. So like the example I've given, Beyonce can sing, I can sing. I can braid probably, Beyonce can't braid. And so each of us have something different, something different. And you know what's interesting? Because um, one of, a few, you know, some, most times, I won't say most times, a few times I've had to be behind the scene um, with uh, Rita Ora, we're getting her hair ready for various things that she does. And this is us standing behind her, getting her hair done. But could she go on stage without her hair done? Now, you will sit there and think, oh yeah, those people behind the scenes who are getting her makeup done and getting her hair done and organizing her clothes are all rubbish people, they don't count. Let's wait until Rita gets on stage and sings. That's when we know that somebody has arrived. That's where we get it wrong. Because without the makeup people, imagine what she's going to look like standing on stage. So do you understand how each gift does count? And you don't have to rubbish any gift. Also, no one individual receives all the gifts in, the, in life. If you had them all, you'd have no need of anyone else. And that would defeat um, God's purpose on earth. To teach us to love and depend on each other. So what he's saying also is, just like not all of us have got one gift, that's the same thing where not one person has all the gifts. And the reason that is, is because God has taught us to learn to depend on each other and love each other. He wants us to be there. You know, God loves family. And that's why he has the Trinity in one. We read that in one of the chapters. So God believes in that communal living, that coming together, in that living together, in that friendship, in that package. And so if he had given one of us all the gifts in the world, then now one person will say, I don't need anybody. And so if that was the case, then the purpose of having community, having family, will no longer be there. So I call it division of labor. Everyone is great at something. And you bring what you are great at on board. You bring it to the table. So everybody can then contribute to, get, to something and we get something great out of it. So our spiritual gifts were not given for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others. Just as other people were given gifts for our benefit. So this is a really good one. We need to understand this. Our gifts were not given just for our own benefit. They were given so we can benefit other people. And the same thing applies to you having a gift and you sharing it so it can benefit me. So I'm giving you a gift of sharing this book with you. You are giving me some gift as well. Do you see how it works? So what he's saying is we should learn to understand the gifts in our hands that God has given us. It's not just for us. It's not for us. 
It's actually to benefit other people. Now imagine Beyonce standing in the mirror, then they are singing to herself. Or who else sings amazingly? Nicki Minaj standing in the mirror and just singing to herself. So that would be her using her gift just for herself. But that's not the purpose of the gift. The gift is for you to share with others. And that's how come they could stand and sing and we enjoy it. So if I come to you and say, I can teach you how to braid hair. I don't want to teach myself how to braid hair. I've learned that over the years. So I cannot teach you how to do it. So this gift of me knowing how to work with hair is not for me again, it's for me to give to you. And that's how it works. So it says, our spiritual gifts were not given for our own benefit, but for the benefit of other people. So also the gift that you have is for other people's benefits. So we should learn to share. The Bible says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping the entire church and the entire world. So whenever you have been given a gift by God, he wants you to use it to help others. It is meant to benefit the world. Big message here. Big, big message here. Because some of us, not just, most of us hide. We don't want anyone to know that we're good at doing something. We feel so inse insecure about it. We feel insignificant about it. We want to um, uh, find like, a, how do you how do you put it? It's like somebody putting putting light on on a candle and taking a cover and covering it. That candle, no one will see it. So that's the same thing with you. God has given you a gift, but what do you do? You go and hide it, and then you come out and you're waiting for other people. And one of the things I've been trying to remind people as well recently is. We should not be sitting down and waiting for the, for the world, waiting for life to give us something. You know that thing, ask not what life can give to you, or rather it's the Americans who choose that word. Ask not what America can give to you. Rather, tell America what you can give her. So it's like, ask, what I'm saying is, ask not life what it can give to you. Rather, you should tell life what you can bring to life. What can I bring to life? And that's where your gift does count with each other. That's how God planned it. I give this one, this one, I give this, I give this. And so each of us, in the past, I remember in history, then it was called trade by butter. So you you sell to, no, then they, were, they didn't use money. It was called the butter system. And so you shared something with me and I shared something with you. So you'll be looking for maybe clothes. I'm into clothes. So you say, Joy, I want to wear some clothes. And I say, oh yeah, I got clothes. And I say, ah, oh, but, but have you got a hair service? Can I want my hair done? Oh yeah, no problem. So I give you clothes and you give me hair. That's how easy it was done. Because that's how God wanted. He wanted us to be dependent on each other. So if others don't use their gifts, you get cheated. And if you don't use your gifts, they get cheated. See how simple this is? So if God has given you a gift and you don't use it, you are actually cheating me. You're cheating people around you. And if he's given me a gift and I don't use it, I am cheating you. So at this time now, we need to sit with ourselves and ask ourselves, what are these gifts that God has given me that I need to give to the world? This is why we are commanded to discover and develop, develop our spiritual gifts. The Bible insists we should do that. We should find out what our spiritual gifts are and start sharing it with the world. And I, I, I believe that this is what is wrong in Africa. We all want to sit there way back in Africa, Nigeria in particular. We want to sit there and wait for the government to do everything for us. Okay, so it makes sense now we understand that yes, the people in government don't really care about the people. But it should not stop us. Because other countries of the world, especially in Asia, they are just getting on with it. We all forget that we are part of a larger system. 
each doing his or her own little bit to make life exciting. Not everyone depending on just one or a few people. When we all contribute with our gifts, we will create a better society. Have you taken time to discover your spiritual gifts? That's the question he's asking us. He says, an unopened gift is worthless. You know, look at it this way. It's your birthday and someone brought you some gifts and they wrapped it so beautifully. And you just put it in the corner and you never bother to open it. Of what use is that gift? That's what he's trying to explain to us. If you wrapped your gift, I mean, they wrapped the gift and they gave it to you and you just put it underneath a table somewhere in your house. <clears throat> that gift is absolutely of no use to you. And this is quite an interesting one because when I got married years ago, <clears throat> way back in Nigeria, um, I had so much gifts and they were all nicely wrapped and everything. In the excitement of marriage and everything that happened, I never opened that, those gifts because somehow I, I did not really have need for anything at that time. One of those times in my life when things were absolutely fine. I never opened any of the gifts until I left Nigeria and everything was packed and left like that. If we had a room where we put everything into locked. And so in the real sense of it, none of those gifts matter to me because I never saw what they were. And so, says an unopened gift is worthless. They were absolutely worthless to me because I never saw one of those things that were out. Years later, people said to me, oh, could I use, could I use, could I said, just go in there and take whatever you want to take. It did not bother me because I didn't see them. So there was no attachment to it. So, if you know you've been given, you know, like if you know, we all know now that we've been given something. You need to go deep into yourself and find out what that thing is and use it. And use it. Because if you don't use it, then it's worthless. He says, whenever we forget these basic truths about gifts, it, is, it always causes trouble in the community and in the church and in the home and in the village and in the country and in the world i am saying that i can say i can say this applies to countries as well what can your country contribute to the world what what are what are their unique special gifts i'm coming from nigeria there's so much there's so much gifts that god gave to our country and to africa but you know what they are like on open gates. We have not opened these gates at all. We've just left them there. And we're sitting down there and waiting. I was watching a video the other day and, and the man was really giving really good comments about how if we can look at what we have, we will not be depending on all these financial aids coming from all over the Western world. Because that's what we tend to do in Africa. Every TV screen you open and want to listen to news, Look at how many children are starving and dying in Africa. Nobody understands the fact that Africa has so much invested in her. Gifts! Unopened gifts! So if we can take our time and try and discover those gifts and start working with them, do you see how much contribution we can make to the world rather than just sitting down and waiting to be given AIDS? It says two common problems Ah, gift envy and gift protection. Gift envy is one, number one. Let's look at it. It says, gift envy occurs when we compare our gifts with others. We feel dissatisfied with what God gave us and become resentful or jealous of how God uses others. Can you hear that? So for instance, I sit here and I feel so jealous about Beyonce because she can sing and she can dance and, and I'm just sitting in myself so angry. Look at her, she dances so well, she sing. I'm not understanding the fact that that is her gift and she's using it properly. So it's 
So that's gift envy. And there's so many people out there who do that. Because to me, I don't, I never really take my time to look at anybody and what they are great at because I understand it. I understand that I got things in my hands that other people don't have. I I attended a workshop once and this was on this was when WordPress first came out. Um, I do have a WordPress page and I'd done my own little bit of understanding of it and it still wasn't right and I thought let me try and understand some more. So I registered to attend a course. It wasn't a cheap course. It was quite expensive for a one day course. And we got there and this lady had this huge, how do they say, chip on her shoulders. Attitude and everything. And she was like, oh, she would just click one thing in seconds and then that's how you do this. Click. That's how you do it. And so everyone was getting so confused and we couldn't understand what she was doing. And then the next thing she said, well, you should know that I'm, I'm not an expert at this. I, I did not create this software. And, we're, and I'm thinking to myself, are you serious? We paid all this money to come and watch you, show us how to do something, and you're having this attitude. And she was rather comfortable with the people, the few people who were clicking as quickly as she was, and she was happy. And you know that funny feeling that you get? I started having this funny feeling like, Am I, am I really not good at this? What's happening to me? And then another voice hit me, snap out of it. There are things you're great at. And you're not going to let this bother you. And I felt good about myself because suddenly that voice will start nagging you and say, look at that, only this little thing, you can't even do it. And I realized, stop it. You are great at so many things that this woman can, cannot even begin to think about. So. Don't let it bother you if you didn't get this her stressed out workshop that's not making sense. Because halfway down there, or not even halfway, before we go, she said, I have to run now because I've got to go pick my kids from school. And I just gave up. I said, you know what? You were not ready for this workshop. So that's how you could feel about things too. Because people around you might start making you feel you're not good at something. And look at how rubbish you are. Not realizing that there are so many things you are good at that they cannot even begin to think about. And so it's not for you to take on that I am not good at what that other person is good at, so I am not good enough. You are good enough. You are good enough at what you were created for. And so the other one is gift protection or projection, gift projection. It says that happens when we expect everyone else to have our gifts. They should do what we are called to do and they should feel as passionate about it as we do. That was another clear case for me. Because just like this lady, she's sitting out there, touch this button, touch that button, and she's running away with it. And she's thinking all of us should be running with her. Look at how foolish they are. That's gift projection. And another example is, is my daughter. One of my daughters, from time with me, she's never loved working with hair. She's made it very clear, Mom, I don't like hair. Just because you love hair doesn't mean I should love hair. And then I used to wonder, why can she not like hair? She's been born with this. I mean, it could also be, you know, what they say, familiarity breeds content. She's seen it so much that it's put her off. But then reading this, it makes sense. Because that's not where she is. That's not who she is. Just because I have passion for her, I love her, I want to work with her, doesn't mean she should do the same thing too. So that's good projection. I shouldn't expect her to have the same passion that I have towards her. And I'm sitting there now and judging her. So that's the same thing. Don't sit down there and worry yourself, worry yourself about something that you know you're not great at. Deep in you, you know it. And this happens again with us African parents. And I know so many people. They, they, they sit their children down and want to hammer down their throat the fact that they should become what the children don't want to become. You have to be a lawyer. You have to be a doctor. You have to be an accountant. This is game projection. Because you're trying to force I, I had a friend in school, this was way back secondary school. 
and we're just young starting our life and the, the, the father of this girl had told her she has to be a doctor every time we walked into the biology lab we bring out this little, little equipment for, 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 for to start working with scientific experiments the, the girl would just try to screw something on and she, her hands would be shaking and she will break it in seconds she will break it this happened every time and then we had to ask her why are you doing this? she said the pressure is on me so much my dad insists I must be a doctor so I don't know it scares me whenever and in the end she didn't even finish secondary school she got married so this is what you find when you try to force your children to become what they don't want to be and we do that a lot in Africa we do it a lot no wonder our system is so messed up because in the process of us chasing our children to become all these big names accountants and doctors and nurses no one is interested in skill based things hand based things carpentry work mechanics work beauty hair fashion few people are into that and the few who go into that everybody's looking down on them making them feel small oh is it not just hair just like people who come in here and they want their hair done and I tell them it's going to cost you this but is it not just braids and then I ask them but do you do braids no I don't so why do you not think it is just braids that's gift projection you think in your head that person is nonsense because they are not doing this fantastic thing that I do. I work in a bank. I am so posh. I put on the tie and I sit on the chair and I talk to you and I roll on my chairs. That's just nothing. If that's your gift, roll with it. But that doesn't mean you should not think that you're better than the person who is doing, who has been given another gift. And that's why we're struggling to find, to find jobs out there. Lots of people finish these universities with all these fantastic grades and academic results and they cannot find a job because they can't create a job. You've been mentally prepared to be somebody's work for somebody. So how are you going to be able to go out there and create your own job? Grades and skills and things that they can work with their hands. You don't need to be employed by somebody. You can create your own job. Anyway. The Bible says there are different kinds of services in the world or in the church, but with it is the same God we are serving. Though we are many, we are one body. So it doesn't matter what God has given to you, we are doing all of it to glorify Him. Sometimes spiritual gifts are overemphasized to the neglect of the other factors God uses to shape us for service. Our gifts reveal one key to discovering God's will for our ministry. So whatever this thing is that you are passionate about, that you are great at, it reveals the kind of role God wants you to take on for Him in life. But the gifts are not the total picture. God has shaped us in four other ways too. And He starts to explain them. Listening to your heart is one way you will know how God has shaped you. The Bible uses the term heart to describe the bundles of desires, of hopes, of interest, of ambitions, of dreams, and of affections that we have. Our heart. Our heart represents the source of our motivation. What we love to do and what we care about most. That's what our heart represents. We use the word in this way when we say, I love, I love you with all my heart. So that's trying to explain to you that, yes, I have every motivation, every desire, every love, every hope in me for this thing. The Bible says, as a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the person. Our heart reveals the real us what we truly are not what others think we are or what circumstances force us to be so what we truly are is what our heart reflects our heart determines why we say the things we do 
why we feel the way we do and why we act the way we do so usually you will just know a person's heart from the way the person does things and i i watch people a lot and i can relate easily especially when people come here to learn the skills that we offer i could just tell the person who loves hair really and the person who doesn't and a good example is my my young my young girl uh, freedom couture who came here when she was only 18 and i could just see from day one in her her passion for hair she was just hungry she was like a sponge and everything she saw auntie could you please tell me how this is done could you please tell me how this is done she was open she was desperate for knowledge that's what the heart shows you and sometimes you find someone who has no heart for something they can train from now till they drop they will not get it they will not get it because their heart is not in it you see physically each of us has unique heartbeats this was an interesting one for me just as we each have unique thumbprints you see the way you know i think in the in the in the passport with thumbprint i'm not sure oh i think the passport is iris so the way you know some people if you cannot sign they say just thumbprint we all have unique thumbprint no two thumbprints are the same we have unique eye prints hence when you're going to like when you're arriving at different countries now they check your iris our eyes are unique no two people have the same eyes our voices are unique too no two voices are the same our heart also beat differently that was a new one for me i didn't understand i didn't know that our heart beats differently i thought all hearts beat the same but that's what he's trying to say to us that we are all so unique so completely different this is amazing that out of the billions of people who have ever lived no one has had a heartbeat exactly like yours or mine that's really something to behold it says in the same way god has given each of us a unique emotional heartbeat so the way we respond to things are completely different that raises when we think about the subject. Activities or circumstances that interest us. A heartbeat is so different. And they race. Each time we think about something, each time we have activities, each time we have circumstances that interest us. So the way our heart will get excited and skip a bit and do all kinds of things it is so different based on the things that interest us isn't this amazing we instinctively care about some things and not about others that is so true because when i when we go on holiday as a family that's a good one um and we hit a city i generally want a city that's got exciting malls that I can walk into and just look around and window shop and see things and and my young son is not interested in all that that's just too much stress for him he just wants to go and sit down and watch his TV and my other daughter she actually does not even go around with us she says I don't want to be part of you guys because the shops I like to stop at and look at things you guys don't want to look at those shops so she normally just says I'll be fine. Let me take public transport. Or if we all go out and get into a mall, we just say to her, put your phone on. You can go off now. So that when we need to go, we'll just call her and say we're good. We are all so different. So we all have different emotional heartbeats. And the things we care about are so different. These are clues to who we are and where we should be serving. So you, you, you now begin to understand who you are now. The, anything that you find braces your heart. Anything that you find excites you. Anything that you find that you feel so at home with. That's who you are. That's when we say your heart. That's where your heart is. 
do you connect with it now? Because I've had people ask me over and over, but I really don't know what I'm passionate about. I really don't know what my gift is. I really don't know what God wants me to do. These are the clues. These are the clues. It's all real. Because again, this was another instance, my, my, one of my daughters, from when she was a baby in school, the minute she gets to school and she sees someone trying to bully another child, she will take it up upon herself. Okay, you want to take on someone your size. I'm ready for you. Why are you trying to bully this person who can't say much? And so she was like that. She got into trouble so many times in school for things that she wasn't meant to be part of. Just because she cannot see another person trying to undo another person. She just felt that is not fair. She made a big thing. But mom, that wasn't fair. That poor child. So she always wanted to be like a spokesperson for them. Like a solicitor for them. Like their lawyer. And I started from when she was young to call her. Yes, yeah, the lawyer. And when she starts, she does not stop. She must win whatever it is. The argument. And today, she studied law. So that just confirms that. From day one, I could see in her this thing that was already planted in her by God. Being like a human rights spokesperson or, or a solicitor for people who are down through it. I tell her all the time, I say, you were already born for this right from when you were a baby. And the other one too, every day from when she was two, the minute she could draw, she started drawing on every chair in the house. Every chair, every chair. And I'll come back from work tired. And there she has finished drawing on the chair. And today you should see her in arts. She does not stop drawing. Now again, as a mother, I could just see it. She don't have expressed it. That this is the stamp that God had already put in her. Same thing with me. I've always everyone around me told me how they saw me as willingly giving it. Whatever little thing I had and so on, I will happily give it out. Oh, you can have it. You can take it. Loving to share, loving to share, loving to share. I still share things. Up until now, I'm still sharing knowledge, sharing skills, sharing information. So that's just who you are. You can tell from the things that excite your heart. Another word for heart is passion, he's telling us. He said there are certain subjects you feel passionate about and others you couldn't care less about. Some experiences turn you on and capture your attention while others turn you off or bore you to tears. This reveals the nature of your heart. So can you begin to relate to it? Anything that puts you off, that's not you. Anything that turns you on, that's who you are. For me, fashion, I'm excited, especially African fashion. So, this reveals the nature of your heart. And when you were growing up, you may have discovered that you were intensely interested in some subjects that no one else in your family cared about. Exactly the story I told you about my kids. Where did those interests come from? They came from God. That's what he's reminding us. All these unique things that excite you came from God. God has a purpose in giving you this inborn interest. And not the, not the word inborn because it was inside you. No one taught you. <coughs> one of my daughter too, she could dance from when she was she got an award for dancing. I never taught her one day. From when she was two, she started listening to music. And every song she has, I love that music. I love that song. I love that song. She loved dancing. It was inborn. So anything that you have been inborn with, and you found that interest so exciting, but you're going to find that some of us, as we grow older, we lose it. We lose interest in those things that God gave us. Your emotional heartbeat is the second key to understanding your shape for service. 
Don't ignore your interests. Consider how they might be used for God's glory. So anything you find that is really exciting you, ask yourself, how can I use this for God's glory? And I can confidently say, reading this book for me, in the process of my sharing, is one of my way of using my interest for God's glory. There's a reason you love to do these things. Repeatedly, the Bible says to us, serve the Lord with all your heart. And so, from the explanation of what goes on in the heart, we can now relate to this. Serve the Lord with all your heart. Give God anything that excites you. God wants us to serve Him passionately, not dutifully. So, if heart means passion, and something gives you so much passion, serve God with that. People rarely excel at tasks they don't enjoy doing or feel passionate about. So anything you don't feel passionate about, it's very rarely you're going to excel in it. You will not excel in it because your passion is not there, your heart is not there. And again, Freedom Kuto is my good example with that. I could see it in her, the excitement that she brought on board and today, She's proved, it, proved me right. She never doubted herself though. Because she told me from day one, Auntie, you're going to see me. I said, yes, I know. I will see you. I'm still here to see. I've seen it. She's so good at what she does. Because her heart is in it. And then I hear people calling me and saying to me, I want to be like her. First thing I ask them is, do you, do you, do you love her? How much do you love her? Because if your heart is not there, you cannot, you cannot get there. And this book is confirming it. People rarely excel at tasks they don't enjoy doing. So if you don't enjoy doing it, it's not the money you're going to put in it that will change that. I, there was a lady who came, to, who came here and said to me, when I open my salon, I want... <coughs> I want, um, what did she say again? I want plasma TV on every workstation. And I said to her, is the plasma TV going to do the hair? Because if you don't have passion for hair, you don't know how to do hair. Is it the plasma TV that will bring clients in? Clients are coming because you're giving them an amazing hair care. Not because you have plasma TV in your shop. And I, I, I actually experienced this in Nigeria once I visited. I went to this salon. It was in a complex. And one of it was at the top floor. You should see all the gizmos and, and equipment and all the way it was beautifully created and designed, the shop. And another shop was on the lower floor. Not much in it. But you should have seen the crowd. Everybody was going to the lower floor. And I wondered why. Because obviously the stylists they knew what they were doing. And the top floor with all the fancy equipment, nobody was there. So it says, God wants us to use our natural interest to serve him and others. We should use all this passion is given us to serve God and to serve other people. Listening for inner promptings can point to the ministry God intends for us to have. How do you know when you are serving God from your heart? How do you know? He says the first telltale sign is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm will tell you if you are actually doing God's will. When you are doing what you love to do, no one has to motivate you or challenge you or check up on you. You see how that works? And this is an interesting one because when you go to work for other people, especially when you work in an office, you find most people, they will only work when they see their boss hanging around them. The minute the boss walks away, they go and play. They're on their phone. They're checking latest uh, uh, story on Facebook. 
you have no passion for that job. Because if you love that job, you don't need your boss to be around you when you do your work. So he says, when you are enthusiastic about something, you're doing it, no one is motivating you, no one is challenging you, no one is checking on you, then you know you're doing something for God. You do it for the sheer enjoyment. You do it because you enjoy doing that thing. You don't need rewards or applauses or payment because you love serving in this way. And this is an interesting one again for me because years ago when I started in hair, and apparently if you want, if they're going to give you an award, some of these awards, so many of these awards, you have to buy it. You pay them money before they give you an award. And I never understood that. Because I thought, hey, I love working with hair. You don't need to give me some paper that says I can work with hair because I know I can work with hair. But there are people who wait until they have all their awards in the world before they can say to themselves, they know how to work with hair. I said, I don't need anyone to give me a paper to say, oh, look at it, you can work with hair. And by God's grace, the awards I've got so far, I never paid a dime for them. People appreciated the, you know, the gifts I brought on board. That's what an award should be. It should be something that comes from what you have worked for. You don't need rewards or applauses or payment because you love serving in this way. The opposite is also true. When you don't have a heart for what you're doing, you are easily discouraged. Any excuse to stop doing it because you just don't like it. Any excuse. So if you love something, it flows out of you. When you don't, any opportunity, this is why it's not working. The second characteristic of serving God from your heart is effectiveness. Whenever you do what God wired you to love um, to do, you love to do it. You get good at it. You get good at it. As you progress, you get better and better. That's effectiveness. Passion drives perfection. I absolutely love that. Passion drives perfection. I know we always say um, a repetition creates perfection. And so practice, practice, practice will bring perfection. But passion is the main thing that drives it. Because if you haven't got the passion, when are you going to even be bothered trying to practice? You give up so quickly. If you don't care about tax, it is unlikely that you excel at it. So you're not going to be bothered. You won't make an effort. In contrast, the highest achievers in any field are those who do it because of passion, not because of duty or not because of profit. So people who stand out in a crowd in anything are people who do it because that passion is there, because their heart is in it. We have all heard people say, I took a job I hate in order to make a lot of money. So someday I can quit and do what I love. He says, this is a big mistake. This is a big mistake. You don't waste your life in a job that doesn't express your heart. There is no point you wasting your life in a job that's not going to give you what you're looking for. Remember the greatest things in life are not things. The greatest things in life are not things. Because for most of us, it's all about the money. What can I get out of it? What can I get out of it? You're not thinking about the joy. You're not thinking about the excitement. You're not thinking about the whatever it is, the enthusiasm. All you want is what's going to come out of it. And this is so true with young people these days. All they want is what am I getting out of that? There's no passion in it. Meaning is far more important than, than money. So that meaning that you get out of something is more important than the money that's going to come out of you. You see, a richest man in the world once said, a simple life in the fear of God is better than a rich life with a ton of headaches. So you might be rich, but all you're having is headache. 
and that is such a good one especially again i bring nigeria into this you get all these people who have stolen so much wealth from the country and all you see them do is parade themselves with with all these henchmen and security and they can't even sleep because they know what they've done their heart has lost it they have no joy in their heart they might have the money to splash but there is no joy that comes with it and that's what you get for not doing something that's from your heart you lose joy there's no peace there's no happiness don't settle for just achieving the good life because the good life is not good enough now what price do you pay for peace of mind what how much money can you buy peace of mind for how much money can you put down to have happiness how much money can you put down to get joy if all you want to do is just let me go get something quickly so ultimately it doesn't satisfy so if all you're interested in is the good life you find that ultimately you lose it because you lack peace if you grow your riches without God there is no price for peace of mind you can have a lot to live on and still have nothing to live for see how interesting this is yes you've made all the money look at money everywhere but suddenly that money does not even give you hope you're not interested you have nothing to live for and I've had people say that a lot when they're about to die they say oh, i'm gonna have to wheel my money to the cat i'll wheel my money to the dog i'll wheel my money to to this to that because there's nothing that's exciting them about life again they are they are quickly given up because what's there to live for it says aim instead for the better life seven god the way that expresses your heart so if you're reflecting how your heart feels can you imagine the amount of joy that comes with it? The kind of hope that comes with it? The kind of excitement that comes with it? So figure out what you love to do. What God gave you a heart to do. And then you do it for His glory. The glory that comes out of your spirit. The fact that you connect with what you're doing will give you so much satisfaction and peace and that's what life should be all about okay so this chapter has ended now and then I'll quickly read our little card and then we're done so a point to remember I was shaped for serving God now our meditation God walks through different men in different ways but he is the same God who achieves his purposes through them all. So he walks through all of us in different ways, but it's all for his purpose. And this was 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6. So the question now is, in what way can I see myself? Can't help it. <laughs> In what way can I see myself passionately serving others and loving it? So, how can we passionately serve others and love it at the same time? Remember the enthusiasm, remember the excitement, remember giving it all your heart, remember the passion. So those are the things you should be thinking about when you're thinking, how can I love, how can I serve other people? and still love it that's what will make who you are that's what will bring out the best in you that's what will excite your future so thank you so much for being part of this and please please remember to share this program with all your friends give us a like if you like it and remember to you know be part of us in every way possible subscribe because there's still many more, there's still 10 more chapters to come. And of course, apart from this, we do so many other things. Our channel is one of those channels with 
variety of things we don't bore you with one thing so i look forward to seeing you in the next chapter thank you so much